and fog land. And, uh, um, and then COVID obviously put the kibosh on the next one. So anyway, by the miracle of Zoom, I'm finally sort of in the Isle of Man. Um, and I'm going to talk to you today about, about bees, which is kind of my favourite subject. Um, I've been studying bees for about 30 years now, mainly, mainly bumblebees, although I do dabble in other insects too. Um, but I thought I'd start out, forgive me if this is a bit obvious, but by, by sort of running through the, the diversity of, of um, bees, because although probably as, as members of the Wildlife Trust, you're, you're very much aware that there are lots of species of bee. Uh, it's surprising how many people aren't. Um, I think there are lots of members of the sort of general population who think there's just one species of bee and it makes honey and it lives in a box. Um, Although if you ask them to draw it, they'll draw something that's kind of fat with yellow and black stripes, which clearly isn't the thing that makes honey and lives in a box at all. Um, so there's a lot of confusion out there. But anyway, um, of course, the honeybee is, is a very familiar uh, domesticated animal primarily. And there's only really one species of honeybee that is widely domesticated and kept around the world. Um, but that's just one of 20,000 species of bees, extraordinary diversity. Actually, I've seen more recent estimates suggesting it's maybe closer to 25,000 species of bee in the world. So the bumblebees are my kind of speciality, which make up about 250 species globally, of which the UK has about 25. Um, but then there's this incredible diversity of other species, and most of them are solitary, which is something that comes as a surprise to, to most people. Um, these, are, these are insects that just live on their own. There's no queen, there's no workers. There's just a female bee makes a little nest and male bees buzz around trying to mate with female bees. So anyway, let me just warm you up by showing you some pictures of some, some of my favorite bees. Um, so let's start off with this one. Um, gorgeous solitary bee. Um, is, this is the, the, got the great name, the hairy footed flower bee. Um, it's a spring bee, it's out in, in April typically, and uh, um, I won't tell you too much about them, but they're, they're quite large for solitary bees, they're often mistaken for bumblebees. And they're called the hairy footed flower bee because the, the males have these hairy feet, only the mid legs, of course they have six legs, it's the mid pair of legs that have the hairy feet. And we don't really know why, but when they're mating, they stroke the face of the female with those hairy feet and she seems to enjoy it. Um, Anyway, lovely, rather handsome bees to keep an eye out for. Um, then at the moment on the, on the wing, um, I've got in my garden, I've got um, these wool carder bees, which is another solitary species. Um, they're named because the females collect wool and hairs from hairy plants. They particularly like to, to, to visit mm -hmm. lamb's ear, which is a, a Stachys uh, byzantina is the Latin name. Um, which is a common garden plant and they love it and they use it in, in building their nests. Um, the males of these bees are really aggressive actually, they're one of the few bees that are territorial, they guard patches of flowers and uh, attack any other bee that dares to come into them, including be bees much bigger than themselves. Then there are bees that don't look much like bees at all. Uh, this is a, a type of cuckoo bee and actually of the about 270 species of bee in the UK, there are about 60 of them are cuckoo bees. So they're, they are bees, um, but they've become parasites on other bees, just like the, the bird, um, or more or less the same. Um, so this, the, this species and most of the other cuckoos, they look for nests of solitary bees. And uh, when the female bee is away, the cuckoo dashes in and lays her own egg, which, uh, hatches very quickly and has it's a the tiny little grub has enormous mandibles, jaws for murdering the host's offspring. Uh, and then it eats all their food. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's all part of life's rich tapestry. We shouldn't think any less of them, but uh, uh, it seems a little, a little harsh on the host. Uh, if we go beyond Britain, there are some really amazing bees in the world. Now, I, I have to confess, I've never seen one of these. Um, this is uh, a blue carpenter bee from China. Uh, one day I would really love to see that. Um, just one more of the world's bees. This one is, is one I have seen. Um, this is uh, an orchid bee from Central and South America. Um, they're called orchid bees uh, because the males visit orchids and the males have 
swollen hollow hind legs. You can see the little inset there. And they, they visit the orchids to, and they collect the, the floral odors uh, and they stuff them in their legs and make a kind of uh, floral, uh, uh, their own perfume. And then when they find a, a female bee, they, they wave their, their legs at her and hope that she likes the, the perfume they've created. Beautiful things as well. It's kind of like flying jewels. If you're getting into bees and you want to identify them, one of the many, it's, it's not easy, I must admit, lots of them look rather similar to one another. Uh, and there also there are lots of creatures pretending to be bees, which adds to the confusion. Um, now, a lot of those insects are flies. There are a lot of flies that have evolved to mimic bees. Now, I have to say, the, this picture here is of an insect, which is a fly. Uh, it's not actually a very good mimic of a bee at all, so it's quite embarrassing. It must have been absolutely infuriating for the, for the authors of this book, Bees of the World, that the publishers decided to put a picture of a fly on the cover. They, they fell for the fly's mimicry. Uh, and apparently they, they printed uh, 4,000 copies before Chris O'Toole saw one. And uh, I can just imagine how livid he was. Uh, sadly, he just died just a few weeks ago. Uh, anyway, um, there are some wonderful mimics of, of bees. Um, so there's one of them. And I'll leave you to, to work out which one is the bee and which one is pretending to be a bee. Um, but that's a rather beautiful species that we get in the UK. So anyway, then on to the bumblebee, which is my kind of um, speciality. Um, bumblebees are, are social, like the honeybee, um, but they have much, much smaller colonies and shorter lived colonies. So uh, the bumblebee kind of colonies start in spring and they're single-handedly founded by a, a queen bee coming out of hibernation. Um, in, in usually in about March and they fly around, they're starving hungry to start with, so they need flowers and then they um, look for somewhere to nest, uh, typically in a hole in the ground in most species. Um, and if they can find a nice cozy dry hole, ideally with an old uh, nest of a mouse or a vole in there for insulation, then they'll gather a little ball of pollen and lay some eggs and they'll sit on the eggs and they incubate them, they shiver to, to produce heat and to warm their, their offspring, just like a bird um, incubates its eggs. Uh, and anyway, the, if that goes well, the eggs hatch and she rears uh, a first batch of larvae, which turn into workers, which are her daughters, smaller versions of her. And they then take over all the foraging. She never has to leave the nest again. Um, and the nest grows, producing more and more workers until it's maybe got two or 300 workers by about this time of year, actually, July, uh, typically. And then they switch to producing the nest switches to producing new queens and males, uh, which fly off from the nest and they mate. Uh, the queens mate just once uh, and then they almost immediately go into hibernation, which can be as early as the middle of summer. Um, the males, that's their job done. They don't do any work in the nest. Um, they don't gather food, they just apart from for themselves. Um, and in fact, it's, it's slightly sad actually that there are roughly seven times as many uh, male bumblebees produced as there are queens produced and given that the queens only mate once that means that six out of seven male bumblebees never get to do the one thing they were born to do. Anyway, um, the old nest dies off, the old queen and all the workers dies off at the end of the summer and it's just those young queens that, that burrow into the ground and hibernate till the following spring. Now, there's something really odd about bumblebees, and, it, and I kind of hinted at it a minute ago when I mentioned this incubation thing. So I remember being taught when I was at school that um, the bumblebee, uh, the, sorry, that insects are cold blooded. Uh, so birds and mammals are warm blooded. We have a, a sort of a regulated body temperature, which is often much warmer than the air temperature around us. Whereas insects, their body temperature is, just fluctuates with the air temperature and they have to bask in the sun if they want to warm up. Um, well, actually that wasn't quite true. There are some insects and the bumblebees are uh, one of the best examples, which are actually more like us than they are other insects. They actually produce their own heat internally. And um, from their flight muscles, which generate heat, and they're big and furry is an adaptation to help maintain an elevated temperature. Uh, and this is an adaptation to living in cold places, which finally brings me to why I'm showing you this map. Um, 
So this is a, a map of the world, fairly self-evident. Um, but the numbers and the colours show you how many species of bumblebee you can find in different parts of the world. And if you're, if you're eagle-eyed, you might spot, if I just put the mouse on it, the number 60, somewhere in the sort of eastern Himalayas, mm -hmm. which is the, if you were going on holiday to see rare and unusual bumblebees, that would be the place to head. It has more species than anywhere else in the world. And it's actually thought that that's where bumblebees evolved. And they, about 30 million years ago, and they spread west from there to us and east through Siberia into Alaska and then down through the Americas. But what the reason I'm showing you this is that it illustrates something quite odd, which is that bumblebees are more common in cooler, temperate parts of the world, and they really don't like warm weather. Um, so they, they, they peter out as you go south in Europe, and there are very few species living in the south of Spain and almost none in North Africa. It's too hot for them. They're big and furry. They, they generate heat internally, so they can fly in the high mountains of the Alps. They can live up into the Arctic Circle. There's a species called Bombus polaris, which lives its whole life cycle in the Arctic Circle, where it's too cold for most insects to fly, but these bumblebees can do it easily. So a, a bumblebee, when it's um, active, has to maintain a temperature of between about 30 and 35 degrees C, which is quite similar to ours. And this is an infrared picture of a, of a bumblebee. Um, and, you, and you can see the thorax there, kind of glowing white hot, obviously not literally white hot. Um, uh, and that, as I say, is where the heat is produced from the flight muscles. The, a bee has to flap her wings about 200 times a second to stay in the air. And you can imagine that generates a lot of heat. Uh, if you try flapping your arms 200 times a second while wearing a fur coat, you'll get the idea. Um, Anyway, the, the, this is all very well. It's a clever adaptation to living in cold climates, but it comes at a cost, an energetic cost. So bumblebees need lots of uh, energy, lots of sugar to fuel this heat generation. Um, and uh, it was once calculated that if you had a, uh, a man-sized bumblebee, so a, a human, a, a normal man running burns the calories in a Mars bar in about an hour of running, which is quite a depressing statistic if you're running to lose weight. Um, if you were a man-sized bumblebee, you'd burn the calories in a Mars bar in 30 seconds of flight, uh, which just kind of illustrates how uh, energetically expensive their lifestyle is. And, and all that energy has to come from nectar, has to come from flowers. And if they can't find enough uh, nectar, then they're in, they're in trouble um, because they then can't fuel this, uh, this um, rapid movement of their flight muscles and their flight slows and they can't take off. And so, and you do occasionally find grounded bumblebees. Um, in fact, my very earliest memory of bumblebees is of finding some, some bedraggled bumblebees that had got caught, they got caught out in the rain and got wet and cold and couldn't fly. And I tried to save them by, but stupidly, I was only seven or eight years old. I put them on the hot plate of the electric cooker um, took them up with a little blanket and put it on its lowest setting. Um, but it was one of those old fashioned ones that took hours to warm up and I got bored and kind of wandered off. And the next thing I knew there was smoke and, and my mum was shouting and the poor bees were all cooked. Um, and maybe I've spent the rest of my life trying to make up for that. But uh, anyway, um, uh, so, so, uh, so bumblebees need a lot of flowers um, to, 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 to keep them in the air. Uh, and they need lots of completely nectar-rich flowers. And, and they've also evolved lots of clever adaptations which enable them uh, to find the most rewarding flowers uh, very efficiently. And one of those is actually the thing that first hooked me on studying bumblebees when I was, um, uh, and I, I just started as, a, as a, an academic at Southampton University. And I was, idly, I was sitting in a, a nature reserve idly watching some bees. Um, I can't really remember why. And I noticed something interesting, which was that bees often fly up to flowers and don't land at the last second, they veer away as if there's something wrong with the flower. And I thought that was quite intriguing. So I, um, I, I sort of looked into it, read about it, couldn't find any explanation in, in the books. Um, 
Uh, and in fact, I ended up spending five years studying this with my PhD student at the time, Jane Stout. And it turns out they sniff flowers as they approach. And if they can smell the smelly footprint of a recent previous bee visitor touching the flower, they know that the previous visitor will have taken the nectar and the pollen. So there's no point in, in landing. So it's just a clever mechanism to enable them to forage that little bit more efficiently. It maybe saves them half a second, but if you're visiting 10,000 flowers a day, then that, that stacks up and, and helps to keep them in the air. Oh, um, sorry, someone's unmuted, I think. But, uh, not really at the moment. Sorry, could everyone just mute themselves? It's a bit confusing. Um, anyway, uh, so I, I, that's how I got interested in studying bumblebees. And I read these books about bumblebees and something that became clear was that the books talked about lots of species of bee as being common that I couldn't find. Things like top left here, the shrill carder bee or the red shanked carder bee or the short haired bumblebee or the moss carder bumblebee, all beautiful bees that used to be common. Um, but I, certainly in the south of England, I, I couldn't find any of these species. They seem to have disappeared. And so I looked into it and started to kind of turn my research to focus on these rarer species and understand what was happening. And um, it became clear that, that, that our, many of our bumblebees were in rapid decline. So I'm just going to show you a couple of quick examples. Um, firstly, this is the great yellow bumblebee, which is a gorgeous, gorgeous bee. Um, used to be found on the Isle of Man, as you can see. Uh, that was its distribution in the first half of the 20th century. Um, but as time went on, it disappeared. And now you've got quite a journey on your hand if you want to see one. It's extinct in England and Wales, um, only found in the very far north and west of, of Scotland. Uh, let me just show you one more. Um, this, this is a, uh, the shrill carder that I mentioned a moment ago. It's called the shrill carder because it has an unusually high pitched buzz, um, interestingly enough. Anyway, it used to be a very common bee in the southern half of Britain um, 60, 70 years ago. But as time went on, uh, its numbers dwindled until by the millennium, um, there were about six uh, populations left. And this was that was roughly when I started getting interested in in these bees. And I went looking for this species and I found it on Salisbury Plain uh, there. Um, it was the first one I ever saw. Um, but that population has since gone extinct, as has, uh, the, well, the one on the Somerset levels there to the west. Um, so the, that one there um, is teetering on the edge of going extinct. So just in the last 20 years, um, two of the last six populations of this bee have fizzled out. So it's still, this is still happening. This is happening on our watch. Um, bees and other wildlife, sadly, are disappearing. And of course that should really worry us because bees are uh, incredibly important ecologically and economically. Um, you've probably heard these figures banded around before, but um, so globally 87% of all plant species need um, some kind of animal pollinator. And in the tropics, it might be a hummingbird or a bat, but it's usually an insect. And in Europe, it's always an insect. Um, not just bees, it must be said, there are also moths, butterflies, flies, wasps, beetles, and so on, all involved in pollination. But between them, the they pollinate the very large majority of plant species. So these plants would set no seeds and would ultimately disappear um, if it weren't for these pollinators. And from a kind of selfish human perspective, um, three quarters of the crops we grow in the world uh, need pollinating by some kind of, um, of insect. Um, everything from apples to tomatoes, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries, um, even things like coffee and chocolate um, depend upon insect pollinators. So if we didn't have them, then our supermarkets would not look so good. And and the horrible truth is we, we couldn't feed everybody on the planet. People would starve. Um, so we really do need to look after these little creatures and avoid ending up like this. Um, so these pictures are from Southwest China, um, rather ironically, very close to where we think bumblebees first evolved 30 million years ago, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but these people are hand pollinating. You may have seen these pictures before. Um, they're hand pollinating their apple and pear orchards because 
there aren't enough insects left um, to do it for them. Um, so the people have become sort of human bees. They send their kids climbing up into the branches with little paintbrushes um, to transfer pollen from flower to flower. Um, it's hard to imagine farmers in Europe hand pollinating their fields of oilseed rape or field beans or whatever. Um, so we need to make sure uh, we look after these, these, these vital pollinators. So what can we do? Well, so I, when I became interested in bee declines, I started doing research on, on this. Um, uh, and we studied, uh, tried to understand why some species of bumblebee had declined more than others. Uh, and what we needed to do to, to, to stop the declines and maybe reverse them. And we did work on farmland and how we might put flowers back into farmland and work on gardens and so on. And we published it all in endlessly in these scientific papers that go in journals that nobody ever reads apart from a handful of other scientists. And I did this for about 10 years, plugging away, studying um, these bees and, and um, it became clear that we kind of knew what needed to be done, but nobody was doing it. And I started to think, well, what is the point of us doing this research? Um, if the only people to read it are scientists, they're not nature reserve wardens, they're not farmers, they're not politicians, and nobody that's actually going to do anything is paying the slightest bit of attention. Um, so, so, for example, we knew, uh, just starting top left, uh, the things we might do to... to um, provide more habitat for bees might, for example, include making gardens more wildlife friendly. And there's a lot of information, which I'll come back to in a moment, about how to do that. We knew that pesticides um, were impacting on bees and we needed to find ways to use fewer pesticides. Uh, we knew that we really needed, one of the big drivers of bumblebee declines was the loss of flower-rich grasslands, um, hay meadows and downland and so on. and, and they can be restored and recreated. And more broadly, we knew that we needed to put more flowers back into farmland, but nobody was doing any of these things. So in 2006, I started a charity, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust. And I should say it was an absolute shambles to start with because I was running it and I did, really didn't know what I was doing. Um, but it, it, it stumbled along and it slowly grew uh, and eventually I stopped, stopped running it and it became much more professional and has since done much better and is now a thriving organisation with 12,000 members and I could highly recommend it if you're interested in bumblebees, do look online and uh, consider joining. Um, anyway, yeah, it's got uh, 42 staff at the last count and it's creating habitat all around Britain for bees. Um, so, for example, this is the very first... Um, uh, nature reserve that the Bumblebee Conservation Trust was involved in creating. This was previously a, an improved grassland with hardly a flower in sight. And this was the first year it was sown with wildflowers. And uh, it was just amazing to walk through this meadow full of flowers and know that it, it wouldn't have been there um, if it hadn't been for the work of, of, of the trust. And it was just alive with, with bees, absolutely beautiful. And it's still there. This is in Scotland in Bain Farm uh, Nature Reserve. Um, but there are lots of others. Anyway, I won't, I won't tell you more about the work of the Trust. Do look at the website if you're interested. Most of us don't have a field we can plant full of flowers, sadly. Great if you do. Uh, but many of you listening will have a garden. And so I'm going to say more now about what we can do in this area, because I think this is something that, that lots of people can engage with. Um, you know, lot, lots of these big environmental issues, like climate change and tropical forests being chopped down and so on. You feel completely helpless, but insect declines are different because we can all get involved. And, and the good news is that most insects haven't gone extinct yet. They could recover and recover really quickly um, if we provide them with habitat. And, and we can get involved in doing that um, in our local area because they live all around us. So there are about 22 million gardens in the United States kingdom covering an area of about a million acres um, which is a bigger area than all of our nature reserves and just imagine if they were all filled with bee friendly flowers where they're all managed for, for for wildlife and if we could add in the road verges the roundabouts the parks the cemeteries all the other urban green spaces as well then that could create a, a national network of of habitat for wildlife not just bees <laughs> 
Uh, and I think this is really exciting. And, and he's, the, 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 the thing is, it's already happening. This isn't just a pipe dream. There are lots of people doing this right now, planting their gardens full of uh, bee-friendly flowers and so on, reducing their pesticide use, rewilding their garden a little has become a, a trendy term. Uh, so it's already happening, but it needs to happen more. We want more people to, to, to engage with, with this. Um, you can tell, I think, this is, uh, this is important. Um, I, and I, I've actually written a couple of books. The Garden Jungle is kind of all about the wildlife of, a, of our gardens and, and how we might encourage it. The Gardening for Bumblebees is more of a DIY manual, a practical guide to what you can do to welcome more pollinators into your garden. Anyway, enough of the book plugs. Let me tell you a little bit more about, about my kind of views on gardening and how we can make our gardens more wildlife friendly. So gardening, we think of as a very green activity, don't we? Um, you know, what could be more green than growing flowers and fruits and vegetables in our garden? But actually, gardening isn't necessarily green at all. It really depends how you do it. Um, and, you know, if, if your idea of gardening is to jump in the car at the weekend and drive to an out of town giant garden center. I don't know if you have them in the Isle of Man, but uh, uh, you probably do. Um, and get a big trolley and fill it up with annual bedding plants grown in a peat-based compost in disposable plastic pots. And then you might get a sack of peat-based compost and you might get some Roundup herbicide and some bug spray and some fertilizer and pile them all in your trolley and off to the checkout. Well. You can see where I'm going here. Um, none of that is very environmentally friendly. Far from it, in fact, it has a, 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 a big negative impact on the environment. And, and at their worst, gardens can be terrible, sterile places that are created at great cost to the environment. Um, this, this is an extreme, of course. This is a garden covered in plastic grass. But while some of us are, are championing wildlife gardening and rewilding, there is a growing trend to cover your garden in plastic like this and put down a plastic lawn. It's terribly depressing. You can even buy plastic wisteria to pin to your fence or your house, which of course flowers for 12 months of the year. What's not to love? Um, oh, it just depresses the hell out of me, to be honest, that people think that's, that's what a garden should be like. And of course it doesn't have to be. Uh, gardens can be teeming with life. They can be amazing places. Um, so, and nothing illustrates that better actually than a lovely book written by a lady called Jenny Owen about the wildlife of her garden. And the, the reason I mention her, she, she lived in Leicester uh, in, in a, quite an urban area and she had a small garden of about an eighth of an acre. So nothing special at all. Um, but she spent 35 years cataloging every species of animal and plant she could find. Um, and after 35 years, her final total was 2,673 different species of animals and plants, of which nearly 2,000, 1,997 were different types of insect. Um, so th there is this extraordinary biodiversity living right under our noses if we just do a little bit to encourage it. You know, it's almost like a rainforest. It's amazing how many species can live in our gardens if we manage them the right way. Um, and from a bee's perspective, the, the right way really just requires providing them with two things. Um, so uh, bees really just need lots of flowers, which I've already sort of touched on, um, and somewhere to nest. And if we give them those two things, they can thrive. So the first thing to consider when you want to, if you're trying to make your garden more bee friendly, is which flowers should I grow? Um, and actually, that's, it's quite a confusing area because there are an incredible number of choices available to us. Um, I, I saw a recent estimate that in the UK, um, you can buy somewhere, somewhere in the region of 70,000 different species or cultivars of plants um, to grow in your garden. So it's bewildering. Which ones do you choose? So to try and help and provide a kind of scientific basis to, to uh, support wildlife gardening. Um, I, I teamed up with a nursery in Oxfordshire um, called Rosie Bee Nursery, which is an organic nursery specializing in bee-friendly flowers. If you want to 
Um, they, they, and they do stuff mail order if you're interested. I don't have shares in the company. Rosie Bee Nursery, uh, which is run by Rosie Rollings. And she did a big trial with a bit of help from me um, to see which plants, um, which garden plants uh, attract the most insects. Uh, she couldn't grow 70,000 of them, obviously, but she grew 111 of the plant species that are um, that appear on most lists of pollinator or insect friendly plants. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with many of them. Uh, and she grew them all side by side in meter square plots. And she spent five years counting how many insects visited each flower to see which were actually the really the best ones to grow in your garden. It was published as a scientific paper. It's open access. It's pretty easy to follow, even if you're not a scientist. It should you be interested. So it's available to to anybody if you can remember the title and type it into Google. Anyway, I'm going to give you the, the headlines from that study. Uh, first of all, um, these were the overall winners the, of, of the 111 plants she grew. Um, the top three were lesser calamint, their bottom left, which I was amazed by. I'd never actually heard of lesser calamint when she, she showed me her data. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a mint flam, family, a herb family plant. Um, but overall, it attracted more insects than any other plant she grew. Uh, number two was um, Hellenium, the bright yellow daisy there, bottom right. And number three was, was uh, one of the many hardy geraniums that we grow in our gardens, almost all of which are really good for, for pollinators, actually. But that was that particular one that did best is called Geranium rosanne. Anyway, so those were the, the best ones overall. But if you looked at any particular insect group, the preferences were quite different, which isn't actually terribly surprising. We know different insects like different kinds of flowers. So my interest are bumblebees and, and uh, Rosie's data suggests that these are the top five plants for bumblebees. If you want to encourage bumblebees, grow some of these. Number one was um, uh, Viper's bugloss, bottom left there. That picture doesn't really do it justice, I have to say. It's a really beautiful uh, native wildflower, actually. Um, uh, it grows to about a metre and a half tall and uh, looks absolutely lovely at this time of year. Uh, I won't go through all of the others. You probably recognise them if you're a gardener. Um, uh, oh, number two, though, la lamb's ear, uh, just next to the echium there. Yeah, let me just point to it. Lamb's ear. That's the one that wool carder bees really love uh, to collect the wool from. Anyway, so that's the ones that bumblebees really liked. Uh, one other result from her study was that um, native wildflower, wildflowers, to, native to the UK, tended on average to be more attractive than non-natives. It wasn't a huge difference, and there are some exceptions. There are some really attractive non-natives for bees. But overall, um, wildflowers seem to be better. So it's a useful rule of thumb. Grow wildflowers if, if you can if they fit into your garden planting scheme or whatever, and many of them do, and many of them look absolutely beautiful. Um, so the top three wildflowers were, were marjoram uh, and the viper's bug gloss I've already mentioned, and greater knapweed there, which are, all of which are beautiful plants to grow in your, in your garden. Which kind of brings me on to a, an interesting topic, which is that of weeds and, and our attitude to weeds. So there are some native wildflowers uh, that we have somewhat demonized, that we have decided are undesirable species, and that if you have them in your garden, you are judged to be a, a poor gardener because we should get rid of these things. And a lot of people spend a lot of time, money, uh, they buy herbicides to kill these plants or they dig them out by the roots, and then they spend more money replacing them with something else. Um, when actually, if you just stand back for a minute and try and forget what you've been taught about these plants, they're beautiful. They're native wildflowers. They're really attractive to insects. I'm, I'm sure you recognize all three of these species, um, dandelions, spear thistle, ragwort. Um, uh, they're all, I grow them all in my garden and, uh, and they're wonderful and they're beautiful and they attract lots of insects. So you can get rid of all the weeds in your garden just like that by calling them wildflowers and being done. And I, I would urge you to try to be, a, to be at least a little more tolerant of these plants. You can save yourself an awful lot of time and effort and the insects will thank you. 
Okay, a couple more ways you can squeeze in more flowers for those hungry bumblebees. Uh, firstly, flowering trees. Um, if you've got room, if you've got a big enough garden, flowering trees provide a wonderful glut of food for insects. Um, I filled my garden, I've got about 45 fruit trees, apples, pears, cherries, plums, uh, and if you buy the right ones, you can actually have a continuity of blossom um, from late February right through to the end of May. Um, uh, of course, you need a lot of room for that. But even if you've got a, a very small garden, you can get fruit trees on dwarfing rootstocks, um, which are sm some of them are, are so dwarf that they'll grow happily in a pot. Um, so, so you don't need a huge space to grow a flowering tree. And of course, if you do grow a tree, as well as pleasing the bees and providing them with food in the spring, they'll return the favour by pollinating and giving you your own lovely crop of zero food miles uh, fruit later in the year, hopefully pesticide free too. Uh, what's better than that? Okay, then the final way you can squeeze in a few more flowers is, is this. Um, lawns, lawn management. Um, now I'm sure you're, most of you have sort of been involved or heard about the kind of debate about cutting of verges and, and lawns and so on, and no mow May, which turned into no mow June. And in fact, my garden is heading towards no mow August. Uh, I still haven't mown my lawn apart from some paths. And it looks amazing. This is actually a picture of my lawn. Um, uh, and uh, I, I had never sown any wildflowers in my lawn at all. It's just the lawn that came with the house when I bought it. And if I don't cut it, it bursts into flower. It's got red clover, white clover, buttercups, dandelions, daisies, speedwell, self-heal. All it's, it's, it's like an instant wildflower meadow and I didn't do anything. It's amazing. And many of us are sitting on our own mini meadow, but we just mow it too much. And it, it, we do have this peculiar British obsession with mowing. You know, um, many people aspire to have a kind of stripy Wimbledon tennis court in their back garden. Well. I can kind of see where they're coming from. It does look sort of pretty, but it supports almost no wildlife and it takes a lot of petrol to keep cutting it all the time. So next time you get the urge to mow because you think the garden is, the lawn is looking a bit shaggy, try to restrain yourself if you can. And, and instead of getting the mower out, you know, get a deck chair out and make yourself a gin and tonic and, uh, or, or a cappuccino, depending on the time of day. And, and, and relax and in, enjoy the flowers as the bees will. Of course, it's not just our lawns um, that we could do this with. There are lots of mown grassland areas in our, our cities and towns and along our roadsides and so on that could all be managed for wildlife. Um, uh, and this is a lovely example from Scotland where that, exactly that is being done. There's a, I used to work at the University of Stirling and in Stirling, um, there is a group of people, they call themselves On The Verge, they're local, it's a local um, group of people, many of them people without their own gardens, um, who've got together and they, they badger the council to give them permission to dig over any bit of mown grass that uh, is owned by the council and sow it with wildflowers. And so that's a road verge, it used to be mown grass with hardly a flower in sight, and now it's full of wildflowers and looks amazing, and there's a, a roundabout. And they've also got um, uh, a, a patch like this next to a rugby pitch. And there's one in a primary school uh, field and, and even one in a prison yard, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, wouldn't it be great, I think, if every roundabout, every road verge, every bit of space we could find was full of flowers. Uh, why do we have these boring moan areas? You can see that, see what, it, you, you know, the other side there that mowing grass, why is that being mown all the time? What a waste of petrol and, and time and money. It could look like this. Anyway, um, instead, rather sadly, this is all too familiar a site in many of our urban areas. Um, you, most of you will recognize what we're looking at here almost straight away. So this was a little bit of vegetation growing around uh, a, a silver birch in this case. Um, it was a bit of greenery, it was probably mostly grass, it probably wasn't spectacularly biodiverse, but it probably had a few insects living in it, there might have been a dandelion, who knows what was there, we'll never know because it's all dead now, um, it's been sprayed by someone from the local council coming around um, with a tank of herbicide on their back or on the back of a quad bike, 
and and it's it's now all sprayed off and dead um whatever life it's supporting is has gone why do we do that why do we employ people to tour our streets looking for anything green and killing it it's completely bonkers that little bit of grass wasn't doing anybody any harm um it just seems to me pointless environmental vandalism and, and to make matters worse the chemical being used is almost certainly roundup which has the active ingredient glyphosate which has become probably the world's most controversial pesticide um, primarily because well there's evidence that it's toxic to bees uh, and it's harmful to soil health um, but but most famously there's pretty good evidence that it causes cancer in humans and there have been some very high profile court cases in the United States where the plaintiffs have in three cases so far all people who had cancer that they linked to occupational exposure to glyphosate all of them won uh, their cases against the manufacturer um, and have got payouts in the billions of dollars um, and yet we're still spraying it in our streets on our pavements even in on um, children's play areas in parks are commonly sprayed around the play equipment uh, to get rid of tall weeds. Um, absolutely mad, if you ask me. I'm a bit rabid on this, um, as you might have guessed. Um, I personally think we should ban pesticides for garden and urban use. There's just no need for pesticides um, in your garden. We don't need to kill every last bit of greenery growing in our streets. Um, and, and we don't need to use them to control insect pests in our gardens either. So um, I often get um, aphids on my roses and on my runner beans and broad beans and so on. I've got a big garden, I grow lots of fruit and veg um, and lots of flowers. Um, and I just leave them. I don't spray them. I could rush out and buy a bug spray and kill them all or most of them. Um, but I don't because I know full well that if I leave them well alone, a whole army of little creatures will come to my rescue, will come and eat them. Ladybirds, hoverflies, lacewings, soldier beetles, they all eat aphids. And exactly that happened this year. In fact, I've made a YouTube video of it, should you be interested. I've got loads of YouTube videos um, uh, in which I, I film my, my, my runner beans, which become infested with aphids. And then within a week, everyone has gone. Well, I say that in the last video, there are a couple left. Actually, now there are none left. Um, and I've done nothing at all. Uh, if I'd sprayed, I might have got aphids, but then I'd have poisoned runner beans. Do I really want to grow runner beans covered in insecticide? Anyway, um, we just don't need them in our gardens. And in fact, I'm doing a petition on the government website on the 5th of August, um, asking government to ban urban pesticides, which is actually just following the example of France. France did this um, two years ago. France is still standing. Uh, Paris, it looks absolutely fine. Um, at least I've only seen it on the telly in the last couple of years for obvious reasons. But um, um, if France can do without urban pesticides, we can do without them and we'd be a lot healthier and the environment would be a lot healthier without them. Okay, uh, so I've talked a lot about how we can get more flowers into our gardens. Um, the one other thing I mentioned that bees need is somewhere to nest. So I'll just finish off by saying a little bit about how we can provide nest sites for bees. So, as I've said, my speciality are bumblebees. But bumblebees turn out to be really hard to persuade to use nest boxes. Um, there are lots of commercial bumblebee nest boxes available. And I've tried out lots of them. I had a PhD student, Gillian Lai, who um, tried out hundreds of different um, uh, bumblebee nest boxes and very few of them worked very often at all. Um, this one is, is a German design called the Schwegler, which in my experience is the most likely to succeed, but they are very expensive. You can get them from the Natural History Bookstore by mail order, but they're about 80 pounds a pop and, and really, I'm not sure it's, it's worth it. They do, they do often attract a bumblebee nest, um, but uh, my impression is actually that, that in, in gardens and urban areas, bumblebees don't have too much trouble finding holes to nest in. It's flowers that usually limit their populations. So maybe don't worry too much about it. I did also go, go get a bit carried away. I built a garden shed a few years ago and I put, I put a course of bricks along the bottom of the shed wall with little gaps 
between them. And then on the inside of the shed has been demonstrated by my son a few years ago now. Um, I built a whole row of bumblebee boxes with flat top lids so I can peek in and see what's happening. And they seem to work quite well. I get bumblebees in them fairly often. Um, I've got 13 of those in a line and most years I get two or three occupied, but it's taken a while and, and it's, it's, it's <laughs> building an entire shed so that you can have some bumblebee nest boxes seems excessive. What is much more practical and easy for most people is to, is to make a bee hotel for solitary bees. So um, uh, many of our solitary bees like to nest in horizontal holes and it's really easy to provide them with those. Um, this ugly thing on the left here is uh, a bee hotel I, I made just by drilling holes in a post. The post's a bit rotten, so it looks awful, but it worked. Um, eight millimeter holes or thereabouts um, are good. And actually within 20 minutes of starting drilling, this was a few springs ago, I had a red mason bee coming to investigate and pretty quickly a whole colony had, had moved in. And then, so the red, the mason bees are on the wing in fairly early spring, and they're great pollinators of fruit trees, by the way. Um, but then later in the year, at about this time of year, you get leafcutter bees using any holes that are left. Leaf, leafcutter bees are named, not surprisingly, because as you can see, they snip snippets of leaf and carry them back um, and take them into the tunnels and they, they sew them together with silk to make a little leafy tube that they then put pollen and lay their eggs in. Uh, gorgeous things to watch in the garden. Um, you can make much more, uh, much more attractive bee hotels than mine. Um, this, these are some made um, homemade designs uh, made from sawing up bits of bamboo cane, which works pretty well. Um, or you can buy all sorts of designs of bee hotel and, and most of them are reasonably effective. This is one of my favorites actually. This is made by a, a company in Liverpool called Nurturing Nature. Um, so it's a, it's a one man company run from a, a, a garage, I think. Um, anyway, uh, but they make really good um, solitary bee hotels. And I say they're really good, but they work. Um, but they also have the added advantage of having a door. Um, so there you go. Um, you take this, that off and you can see what's happening inside, which is really fun um, and great way to engage kids and, and well, everybody really. Um, because normally, of course, with a bee hotel, you've no idea what's going on inside the tunnels, but you can see here, these are all the offspring of mason bees. So the, they're called mason bees because the mother makes little clay walls, builds little walls between each of her offspring and there's the yellow pollen, and then these grubs eating the pollen, um, sort of comma-shaped little creatures, which next year will produce the next generation of mason bees. Great fun to see them developing. Okay, so if you do all of that, you can provide a home for bees in your garden, somewhere to nest, and lots of flowers um, to keep them happy all through the spring and summer, hopefully. And this is really important. Uh, I don't want to finish on a downer, but I'm slightly going to, um, because bees are still declining so far as we know. Everything we've done, all the agri-environment schemes we've introduced, all the wildlife gardening that's gone on, everything so far hasn't really stopped the decline. So the, this chart shows you the a measure of the average range sizes of British hoverflies at the top. Uh, and British wild bees, these are the blue line here. Um, and, and overall, since 1980, um, hoverflies and bees range each, the, the range of each species, the geographic area they're found in, has declined by about 25%. And that's when BBC, the Bumblebee Conservation Trust, was started in 2006 to try and stop bee declines. And it actually, I mean, it's a silly thing to say, but it almost looks like we made it worse because it seems like the declines have almost accelerated since we started doing something to save bees. Um, of course, that's not, uh, not cause and effect, but nonetheless, it's a bit depressing. So we, this really is serious. Um, our bees are on, in, in trouble and uh, we need to help. We all need to do everything we can um, to, to you know, pull out all the stops um, before it's too late or else we really will lose a lot of these species. And, and more broadly, I don't wanna to be too dramatic, but there is a real danger that, that 
future generations will end up living in a, a really impoverished world um, that's lost most of its, its natural beauty and a lot of its natural resources. And life will be difficult if, for example, there aren't enough insect pollinators. So let's all do our bit and let's start by looking after all the insects that live um, in our gardens. Thank you everybody for <laughs> bearing with me. One final book plug, I have a new one, Silent Earth, which is out on the 5th of August, just a few days away, um, which is all about, more broadly about insect declines, why insects are important and, and what everybody um, can do to help. Thank you all for listening. Um, thank you, Dave. Um, in the Zoom tradition, I think I'm gonna ask everyone to give a round of applause, those that have got their cameras on. Right, we, we have some questions. I'm going to give the opportunity for people who've put the questions into the chat room to actually ask them themselves and switch their microphones on. So the first one is Jane, please. Jane, I'm going to, Jane Prescott, Prescott, could you come in with your question today? Hi, thank, thank you very much for that, um, Dave. Um, having read, read your books, it's been an absolute delight to, um, to hear you. Um, just my question was, um, what's your feeling about um, any potential competition between honeybees and native bees? Um, I often see talk about um, placing beehives into um, sort of natural wildlife type areas. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure whether there's been any um, sort of research as to whether it, there is, whether that reduces foraging for native bees and whether there's any direct competition. Yeah, sorry, I, my internet has just seemed, I hope you could hear me during my talk. It's just gone a bit wobbly and I missed part of what you were saying. Um, but is there competition between honeybees and wild bees and other pollinators? I mean, the, the, yes, the, the, the blunt truth is there is clear evidence that there really is competition and that if you have too many honeybees, um, then they strip all the resources and there are that does have an impact on bumblebee nests and other wild insects that also need the same resources the, the nectar and the pollen and um, so um you know this is not to be not to have a go at honeybee keepers at all honeybees are really important for crop pollination and and for producing honey which most of us love um but we just need a little bit of common sense um you know if there's a for example a rare Bee, wild bee species on a nature reserve, then you shouldn't put honeybee hives there because that will probably impact on it. Um, but there are there's you know plenty of places where we can have honey um, in urban areas, in farmland, and so on. So uh, I don't think it's a problem. It just requires you know a little a little bit of kind of um, compromise and application of common sense. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very much. I'm going to ask Sarah, please, if you could. Unmute yourself and ask your question for Dave. I've realised which Sarah is now. Hello, I can see you struggling to unmute. You're off. I still can't hear anything. Is it just me? Now, Sarah, I'm going to ask it for you to speed things up. <laughs> I could see you and your daughter, one of your daughters. So uh, the question is, Dave, um, the councils or some councils argue that we cause damage to roads and pavements. What do you suggest we use when they give us that argument, please? Yeah, so more broadly, I, I this is passing the book slightly, but I would refer you to there's a really cool organisation called PAN or Pesticide Action Network who um, specialize in, in this kind of area and have a campaign, uh, the Pesticide Free Towns campaign. And their website has a lot of advice on what the alternatives are, including examples of places that have gone pesticide free, urban areas that have gone pesticide free already and how they coped. Um, so that's the place to get detailed. Um, but there are alternatives, I mean, well, firstly, it's often exaggerated, you know, most plants do not rip the pavement apart. It's usually tree roots that do damage to, to pavements if anything's going to. Um, but there are alternatives to, to, to glyphosate. Um, uh, for example, you can get a hot foam system, which essentially cooks the plants in, in hot water um, and uses a foam to keep the, the 
the heat in long enough to kill the plants. Um, and those are commercially available, um, completely benign to er everything else. But the, the better solution is, is to have some weeds because they obviously they provide flowers, they provide habitat. We shouldn't, we should try to be a little more, I think, a little, little more accepting of untidiness in our streets and not try to kill every last blade of grass that comes up between the pavement, it's cracks. Thank you. And um, Graham, please. Uh, thanks, Lee. Um, I'm going to try and sneak in two questions, if I may. Um, the first one was about the bee hotels. I've, I've had two, one which was a shop bought one uh, using bamboo, and, and that's been very successful with almost every hole filled with, with red mason bees. Um, so then I thought I'd have a go, at, because I, I was told that the depth of the holes mattered because they lay the, the eggs for the females deeper in. So if they're only two inches deep, then you don't get any females. So I wonder what your, your view was on that. But also I, I thought I'd have a go at making my own. So I drilled some, I think there were about eight millimeter holes into a, an old tree stump. Um, uh, and um, uh, that's been completely unsuccessful as far as I can see. Um, and I wondered whether the fact that the edges of the holes were quite rough was an issue because I'd heard that as well. And yeah, then, I, I've heard. Sorry, but my other question very quickly was uh, about the um, uh, the cardabies, the, the, the great yellow cardaby and the short cardaby. Was there any evidence that it was just habitat loss that led to their demise or was climate change? Because one of them looked like they were sort of pushed northward as they as they disappeared. Was there any climate change involved in that? Yeah, so um, the great yellow bumblebee looks like it's gone northwards, but the shrill cardaby went southwards. Um, the evidence is, I think, actually, that probably neither has anything to do with climate change or, or not much to do with climate change. And it's, it's much more to do with loss of... They're, they're both species of um, species-rich grassland. They're meadow species that used to thrive in hay meadows and chalk downland, uh, places you know, rich in, in clovers and so on. Um, and those are the places they've retreated to. Um, but the, the great yellow was always a much more northerly species. So it's contracted to kind of towards the core of its range, which was always in Scotland. Whereas the, the shrill carder was always a more southerly species and was contracted southwards. Um, but yeah, I, don't, I, I know exactly what you mean. People, people always think it must be something to do with it's Probably not, or at least not primarily. Um, B hotels, I've heard the thing about rough edges and people say that they, they damage their wings if the edges are rough. I don't, I've never seen any scientific evidence to support that, but it may well be true. Um, although, you know, bees manage with all sorts of random holes in the wild that aren't polished or, you know, will ha sometimes have rough edges. They'll nest in snapped off bramble stems, for example, which, you know, nobody's cut a neat uh, break there. So. I, I'm not sure it's such a big deal. I certainly find that I've put a made a, a bee hotel by drilling lots of holes in a piece of wood. And I did my best to make the holes. <laughs> but they're not perfect. Uh, and that has been used. So it seems to be a, there's a lot of luck involved as to whether a bee hotel fills up or not. Depth is definitely important. Firstly, as you mentioned, because um, they always put the females at the bottom of the holes and if it's not deep enough there aren't any room for females and obviously from a population point of view that's disastrous. But also because um, if you have woodpeckers, uh, which I do, they, lo they love eating baby uh, mason bees um, and they would use their, their spiky tongue and it will go in about five or six centimetres. Uh, so all the ones near the entrance uh, stand a really high risk of being eaten at some point over the autumn or winter. But if the hole is deep enough, at least some of them, and that will mostly be the females, will survive. So as deep as possible, yeah, it's quite difficult with a drill to make a really, really deep hole, but uh, the deeper the better as far as the bees are concerned. Thank you. Um, Viv, I'll bring you in, please. Hi, thanks, Dave. That was fantastic. Um, I'm always a bit worried about the, the balance between getting the flowers to grow in a meadow and uh, leaving it for insects. So at the end of the uh, summer, usually late August, beginning of September, the meadows all mowed. Um, but at the same time, I'm thinking of all the insects and animal life that's cut to pieces by the mower and the tractor and everything else. But if I don't cut it, then it becomes rank longer grass 
and less flowers. How do you deal with that balance? Yeah, it is very difficult isn't it? and it always seems wrong to go in with a, a tractor or, or whatever and mow it flat when there are still lots of insects in there and sometimes there'll be some flowers still in August or whenever you cut. Um, uh, but of course, traditional hay meadows were managed by cutting usually earlier than that, often would have been in early July, even late June, depending on what the weather had been like. Um, and it's that management over, I mean, often hundreds of years that created that flower rich habitat in the first place. So we do, you, you do have to cut, obviously, if you don't cut at all, then, then it will degenerate completely. Um, one solution, if you've got the time and, and enthusiasm, is, is to leave a portion of it until much later in the summer. Um, you know, so you, you, do your, you do your main cut in say August, but then leave a quarter of the field or your lawn or whatever it might be, right into as late as you can into September, uh, which would give you an absolutely hopeless hay crop. And be, it wouldn't be, have any nutritive value at all, but then change the quarter that you leave the following year so that it's, so that you, it's not always the same quarter that's being cut really late. It's a right fiddle though, and most people aren't going to, you know, you can never ask a farmer to do that. But uh, if it's your own little patch and you've got a tractor, you can play around like that and it probably helps. Okay, thank you. Um, Ian has got a question for you as well. Um, we, um, we hear about the advantages for humans of um, uh, eating seasonally. Uh, do you have to have a range of flowers that uh, flower at different stages to satisfy your insects. I noticed uh, in the uh, the range of flowers that were particularly successful, uh, some are actually uh, different seasons. Yeah, um, so in an ideal world, you, you'd provide flowers right from when the first bees become active um, in late February, March, um, through to when bees cease to be active and all the bumblebee colonies die off, which is in about September. Um, it depends on the size of your garden. If, you know, for many people, that isn't possible. Um, in an ideal world, not only would you provide a, 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 a continuous banquet of flowers right through the year, um, but also you'd try to cater for the different pollinators that have different preferences. So you'd have deep flowers for long-tongued bumblebees like the garden bumblebee. So they like foxgloves and honeysuckle and so on. And you'd have shallower flowers for the shorter tongued bumblebees. And then you'd have really shallow flowers for the solitary bees and the hoverflies and so on. So it becomes a bit complicated and you, you, could, you could get, you know, tie yourself in knots trying to provide food all the time for everybody. And you never do it in a, in a garden unless you, you know, um, Got, got rolling acres um, and all, a lot of time on your hands. But whatever you provide is good. And of course the bees don't care where the garden fences are. So if there are times of the year when you know, there are gaps in what you can provide, the bees will hopefully find something not too far away if you're in a village or a town. Um, uh, so you know, don't, 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 don't sort of agonize too much over it. The time that's probably most critical is early spring, um, particularly for bumblebees when the queens come out of hibernation, sort of typically March, April, and they're starving hungry and they have to single-handedly build a nest, which must, you know, so they're, they're trying to incubate their brood, but they have to dash off every, every little while to gather some more nectar to, to provide them with the energy and to feed to their offspring. And we think that that's probably the most stressful time when most bumblebee nests die. Um, so having lots of stuff, things like pulmonaria and crocuses and grape hyacinth and bluebells and so on to, to hit that early period. And I shouldn't, shouldn't forget to mention pussy willow is probably the, the, actually the biggest source of food in early spring for bees. Um, then, you know, that, that's probably the, the, the most vital thing you can do. But lots of flowers, as many as you can, um, is, is really the answer, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there's another question from Jane about glyphosate, but I think you've answered it with the hot phone. But Dave, for my own benefit, because I didn't scribble it down, if not for the others, what was the name of the organisation you mentioned that, that's in, in terms of urban pesticide reduction? Yeah, Pesticide Action Network, or just known, sometimes known as PAN. 
They're really, they're, it's an international organization, but it's, it has a UK office based in Brighton, actually, near me. Um, but they're really, really good. Um, they give you very sensible advice uh, if you want to um, have a campaign to go pesticide free in your local area or whatever. Thank you. Um, Don, Don Esselman, I'll bring you in, please. Hello, Dave. Um, I've read that um, some, somewhere I've read that the so-called RHS bee friendly plants, some of them aren't exactly bee friendly. Is that the case? And also I've noticed in the uh, some of the plant companies, brochures, catalogues, that they're advertised as pollen free plants. Why would people develop pollen free plants? Uh, so you're absolutely right. Um, the, what you read was based on some work we did um, three years ago where we um, we drove around all the local garden centres on, on the big chain DIY stores and we bought a selection of plants that were being sold as bee friendly. So a lot of them, as you mentioned, use the RHS's perfect for pollinator logo or some have their own logo with a bumblebee or whatever. And they've, they've, garden centres use it as a marketing tool. They flag up the plants that are attractive to pollinators. And, and obviously that's so those of us that want to make our gardens attractive to pollinators will buy those plants for, in preference, which all makes perfect sense. So we bought them but we and tested them for pesticides because we had a suspicion that we would find them and we did, lots of them. Um, so nearly every plant we tested had at least one pesticide in. Um, the worst was a little heather plant that had no less than 10 different pesticides in it. It had five different insecticides and five different types of fungicide in one little plant. And it was being sold as bee friendly. Um, so broadly, 75% of the plants we tested had in one type of insecticide or more in them. And 70% contained things called neonicotinoids, which many of you will have heard of. They became notorious for being toxic to bees. They are incredibly toxic to bees. They've been banned in, in farming actually now, uh, and they should be banned for use in ornamental plants. But three years ago was before that ban. Um, and they were in all these plants being sold as bee friendly. Um, so it's, it's a, quite a scandal, I think. It's pretty outrageous that, um, that this is happening. The garden centers, to be fair to them, haven't got a clue because they almost all buy these plants in from wholesalers and many of them get them from abroad, the Netherlands in particular. I think we've frozen Dave out, but we'll, let's just give him a chance to return. And while, while we're waiting for Dave to return, um, we, we've still got potentially another sort of, say, 10 minutes. Um, there's one more question in the chat. Oh, no, sorry, I've got two. Thanks, Kate. I've got two more questions. We've probably got room for one more. So if there's one, if there's one more of you thinking about asking a question now, if we can get Dave back, I think we'll take three more questions. So don't be shy. And let's hope we get him back. You might want to mute. I hope we get to ask your question, Heidi, because I'm really curious what the answer is. <laughs> it's a good question. Thanks, Kim. So I'm going to draw a line at those questions. So if you didn't type by now, it's too late, I'm afraid. But let's hope we get Dave back. Otherwise, what I will do is I'll, I'll take these down and email him, and I'm sure he'll answer this for us. 
gap filling. But um, as an ex nurseryman that used to grow lots of plants, I find it fascinating that that these plants can be badged up as as bee friendly when they have no sort of provenance in terms of the pesticides that are used on them. So very interesting. And I can see Dave's back. Well done. I don't have to gap fill anymore. So Dave, I've got three more questions for you. And the first it's one- It's the curse of the Isle of Man, I tell you. Well, we like to think it's the joy of the Isle of Man. It's, <laughs> it's like the, 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 the mist of Mananans keeping you, just pushed you back a bit. Um, so I'm, you've got three more for you, Dave, if that's okay. Um, I'm going to pass to Heidi. Hi, Dave. Hi. Hi. Um, thanks for coming back to us. Yeah, it's um, like I away. <laughs> it's okay. Um, when you showed us the graph um, with the decline of the bumblebee, um, it started at 1980, I think it was, and it showed a decline, <clears throat> particularly from 2004 to today. And it just made me think, is there a link with that, um, with the increased use of mo mobile phones? Um, I don't know, is the honest truth. Uh, the, 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 I'm not aware of any good study on this. Um, there have been some pretty rubbish studies um, that aren't very, very convincing. So there, there was one I saw where they they put a, a mobile phone in a honeybee hive and then showed that it, it seemed to cause the bees some disturbance and they were they did more piping, which is something they do when they're stressed, it's funny little noises. Um, but it, it was totally unreplicated. And, and in any case, people don't normally put mobile phones inside bee nests. So what it really means, I don't know. Um, there's a lot of concern at the moment about 5G and what impact that might have on wildlife. Um, and I think there is reason to be at least a little bit concerned. It, would, it seems that it hasn't been really thoroughly tested to be absolutely sure it's safe, which mm -hmm. is worrying given that it's being rolled out all around the world. Um, but again, there's, I've, 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 I've not seen any concrete evidence one way or the other, really. So. It's a bit of an unknown. Sorry, I wish I could. Oh, it just yeah, I was just curious. Yeah. Yeah, I I I wrote about it in the in the, in the new book, Silent Earth, as best I could, but I I ended up sort of sitting on the fence, really. Um, sorry. All right. Thanks, Dave. Uh, Kate, please. Hi, Kate. Hi, Dave. Hi. Um, I've, I've got a, a, a little urban garden and I've stuffed it full of as many flowers as I can and I, and I, I do get bumblebees in. It's a great pleasure. But it, it often feels like a drop in the ocean. Um, it would be, a, it, it, I kind of feel that and it, it's a bit depressing hearing how insect declines are, are progressing. And um, it would be nice to know that uh, the farming movement is, is making some effort towards reducing this. So I just wondered what you thought about regenerative farming. Um, the Nature Friendly Farming Network, for instance, is, is uh, active in this area. Yeah, I mean, I didn't go into farming today. I sometimes try to in, in, in different talks. Um, I mean, clearly we can only do so much in urban areas. I know exactly how you feel. I, I've got a big garden, but it's still a drop in the ocean. Um, you know, farmland covers, I think it's 70% of the UK. And the big driver of bee declines has, has been the intensification of farming. Um, the way the landscape has changed, you know, bigger fields, bigger monocultures, more pesticides, um, more potent pesticides in recent decades. Um, and we, I, I do firmly believe that, that that's an unsustainable direction that we've gone in. Um, I mean, farming is, is the biggest driver of biodiversity loss globally, um, but it's also a massive contributor to climate change as, as it's currently done. And it's damaging the soils um, in, in a really rather frightening way. And there's talk of, you know, Maybe in many parts of the world, we've only got 50 harvests left and this kind of thing because the soil's so degraded. And anyway, 
Um, th there are many, many reasons for arguing that, uh, that farming needs to change and pretty radically. Um, and I, I'm, you know, obviously 100% in favor of trying to find more sustainable ways of feeding everybody. Um, I think it actually could easily be done. The current system is also incredibly wasteful. You know, we, we waste about a third of the food that's grown in the world, and then we feed about a third to livestock um, in intensive animal units, which is not a very efficient way of feeding people. So we need to look at that. Um, uh, but yeah, broadly, um, we, we do need to, to completely revise our approach to food. Um, and I kind of was quite excited when Michael Gove was, it seems a strange thing to say, but when Michael Gove was environment secretary, it seemed to make a lot of sense. He, he seemed to have some really good ideas. And, uh, um, but I, it, I'm somewhat concerned that the new uh, agriculture bill and the environment bills both seem to be being watered down. And um, that I think we might end up with something quite similar to the status quo, which, which you know, will be a disaster if that's what we end up with. Um, time will tell, but uh, um, I guess we still need to be campaigning as much as we can in that area to put pressure on government. Thank you. Um, last question, please, to Kim. Evening, Kim. Hi, folks. Um, just thinking about uh, the uh, bee friendly plants from nurseries that aren't, in fact, bee friendly. Um, are you going to depress me and say that that might be the same story with seeds that are sold for bee friendly plants? No, probably not. Um, Good. <laughs> the, the plants that produce those seeds may well have been treated with a pesticide, but by the time you've grown a plant from a seed, um, it, it will contain very little pesticide. I sh I, so there's a, there's, if people are wondering, they might be thinking, well, hang on a minute, what about these pesticide coated seeds that farmers use? That's different. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the seed is actively coated with pesticide uh, in the way that, for example, wheat and oilseed rape crops um, are, then there, there will be a, a significant residue in the plant. But the seeds that are sold, the wildflower seeds that are sold are not coated with pesticide. Um, so even if the parent plant may have been sprayed the previous year, the amount in the seed 